Yeah, hydration is an issue today. And I don't even have as bad as those in Northern Europe. It's only 33 here, not 43. So my heart goes out to you if you're in that heat right now and you're not in a place with air conditioning, as I am also not because of the street. <laughs> All righty. Cool. Cool, Julio. Oh, we're going to see if we can do this. I splashed water all over my face. It instantly evaporated. We are back. Okay, so I think I got it. <laughs> I took some time. And it looks like Elijah also took some time. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah. Uh, YouTube, it's really hot. I'm not going to do a whole thing. Just hi. It's nice to have you. But we got to get back into this paper. Okay, so I think this is what we're dealing with. Within manner... Everything is the same manner. So everything is a fricative. That makes sense. Everything is a fricative. And we're just looking at, we have different places and voicings of the fricatives. So we have, say, f, v, and we have r, but no ch. Right. Within manner. We also have the between manner, which actually I kind of want to just call within voicing because I think that's a little bit better. So between manner, fixed voice onset time, so fixed voicing. So everything here is voiceless and we vary place and manner. So we have stops. Uh, yeah, we have stops at the labial, fricative of the labial. Stop at the dorsal, eh, no, or velar, no velar fricative. That is what we're looking at. This more common, less common for. Okay, so that's what it's saying. <sighs> okay, chat, what do you think? Within voicing, do we like it? I think I like it. Great. Uh, okay, so then what else do we have? The between manner, the within voicing gaps. So we are lacking other common gaps so we're talking about fricatives here so let's get this fricatives other common gaps f r h interesting h so this is where if you have h this would be something where you have like a glottal stop because we're between we're between manner so if you have a, a between manner gap for huh, that implies you have, say, like a, you have puh, fuh, and you have uh, but no huh. I think that's what we're dealing with. Okay, great. Let's not spend a great deal of time on this because my brain is breaking a bit. Okay, what is the take home here? Conclusion. Um... We have biases against places of articulation, i.e. more likely to acquire voiced coronal fricatives or more prone to acquire voiced coronal fricatives than, than voiceless labiodental or velar. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. <clears throat> okay, and then what do we learn for this? For the within manner, we learned that we're biased against voice obstruence. And we can write this probably rather acquire voiced coronal than, <clears throat> than voiceless labiodental or velar. Hey Sparsh, welcome. We're we're trying to beat the heat. We're we're trying to uh, understand the nature of constant inventory gaps. And I don't know if we're being entirely successful at either task, but we're giving it our honest try, and that's really what matters. Right. Okay. We have. I'm not going to worry too much about this inverse business. Let's see what the conclusion is. Rather profound differences in how sub-inventories are structured in different languages. 
Okay, interesting. So let's talk about the voiceless retroflex stop. It's a rather common between manner gap in inventories with the retroflex sh. So you would have some retroflexes, um, but not the stop, not the voiceless stop. So you'd have sh, but not ta. Mandarin, I guess, would be a good example of, of this kind of an inventory. Yeah, so such inventories are characteristic of Uralic and Santa Tibetan languages of the Circum-Tibetan area. But in Africa, apparently we have the same gap. We have the same tra gap, voiceless retroflex stop. But instead of having the sh be the thing that points to the gap, it's da. It's the voiced equivalent. So, so here's a, it's like three types of retroflex systems. Type one, uh, so we can call this the, the circum-Tibetan type. Note that this is not the only place where these occur, but this is kind of characteristic. So retroflex fricatives, but um, so one or two retroflex fricatives. The African, where you have one retroflex stop in the inventory, and then the full system, where you where retroflex is its own like fully featured place of articulation, uh, stops, fricatives, and maybe even affricates. That's kind of a neat aside. And this is where I think the real meat of of typology kind of comes in for me at least is when we get this this idea that there are kind of three types like what we were considering when we look at the constant inventory we see this column that says retroflex and we assume that, that retroflex is kind of the same everywhere but it turns out that languages organize their retroflex systems kind of differently and we can put them into three sort of groups that's cool that's i think an innovation so awesome all right, I think I need to hydrate because I feel my voice starting to get a bit scratchy. Yeah, hydration is an issue today. Okay, and I don't even have as bad heat as, as those in um, Northern Europe have today. It's only, only 33 here today, not 43. So my heart goes out to you if you're, if you're in that heat right now and you're not in a place with air conditioning, as I am also not, because of the stream. <laughs> All righty. Where were we? Fricatives and affricates. Didn't we just do fricatives? Oh no, we were doing stops. But sometimes I wonder. Stops and fricatives. Fricatives and affricates. I guess we're talking about fricatives a lot. I'm kind of confused there. Oh, this is comparing stops and fricatives because yeah, we're we're between manner. Okay. So stop, subs and fricatives, fricatives and affricates. It's really interesting the cognitive load that uh, a paper can put on you. And you have to sort of enter into the world of this paper, which creates its own new terminology, its own set of oppositions, its own things for you to sort of hold in your mind as you're reading it, defining its terms at the start, and then you have to sort of carry those forward. And it's actually quite difficult as, uh, as we're finding today. Of course, we're not in ideal circumstances, but when, you know, when are we ever? Okay, so ooh, fricatives and affricates. All right, so direct between manner affricate gaps. Here's that terminology coming again. So I'm gonna copy down our, dis our definition between manner affricate gaps. These are fixed voicing, varying place and manner. So you have, it's where you have an affricate in one spot, but then it's when you say have a stop and an affricate in, or sorry, a fricative and an affricate in two places. So say you have s, f, s, f, and you also have s, but you don't have p, f. That, that's what this is telling us, p, f is a so most commas p next we have s and k and then we get v so this would be if you have a language that has v z z 
but no v. And I think if we've explored a lot of different languages and seen a lot of different inventories, these sort of make sense. It's very common for us to see those affricates clustering around in the uh, in the coronal place and not extending to the labial place. So we may have ts, but many languages like pf when they have ts, even if they do have p or f. So German is a language, an example of a language that does not have this gap, but many languages with ts do have this gap. But the thing that's a bit uncommon or unexpected is the presence of ts here. Ts is what I would think of as the most common or one of the most common places of articulation to have an affricate at. But it is explained here that the presence of ch is causing this gap. So we have, say, a system like s, sh, ch, which is the English system. And so we have this ts gap there between manner gap of ts. Interesting. Yeah, and then the rest are less common. I feel like I'm back in Arizona again. If you, I, I remember when I moved to Arizona for the first time, or yeah, when I moved to Arizona, because I haven't, I've only ever moved there once. Um, they told me if you are thirsty, it's already too late. The uh, rate of evaporation is so high that you have to sort of keep drinking it if you're not thirsty, so that you don't get to the point where you, you feel it because. If you feel it, it's already kind of gone too far. I mean, it's, I mean, you're, nothing too bad is going to happen to you, but you should you should drink. All right, so yeah, cool. What is our next step? Okay, let's learn about the relationship between gaps and inventory size, and we may be able to. I, I'll, I'll put in a, a quick break. Mm, no, you know what? Let's just. Let's just forge ahead. I don't want to give Lucy more more segments to catch up on. So, gaps in inventory size. One question that arises when looking at data on gaps is whether there's a limiting ratio of gaps to the number of segments in an inventory that languages converge to. Okay, so let's restate that. Do large inventories tend to have more gaps than smaller ones? Well, they have more opportunities to, certainly. Right there we are. They have more opportunities to have gaps because they're just more, more. You know, there are more segments, so there can be more gaps. Um, but how skewed can these large inventories become? Interestingly, says the author, it's actually small inventories which tend to be more skewed than large inventories, which is kind of interesting. Actually, that's really interesting because you would definitely expect the larger inventories because they have more just opportunities to have more gaps. Huh, cool, coolio. Okay, so what? The absolute number of gaps grows in linear fashion with the inventory size. The maximum value is 13. But the ratio of the number of gaps to the inventory size quickly stabilizes to 0 0.08. Interesting. So if you have, if you have a if you have a gap, if you have an inventory size of 20, let's see if we can look at this on the map. If you have it, oh yeah, interesting. Okay, interesting. Here's the ratio, right? So this is just the, the raw count of number of gaps as the inventory size goes up. As you can see, um, smaller inventories seem to be more common. As we go farther right, there are fewer there are fewer languages, and so things get a bit fluty out here. They trombone out. I don't know. Is that a is that a valid thing to say? Um, so we have, I don't know, on average a gap of a gap count of about two. If you have a an inventory of uh, inventory size of twenty, granted, there's a lot of dispersion around that, so I don't know how much we can really say. Um, and then the this is the ratio. So while it seems that the the smaller inventories have more gaps, 
on average with a, a ratio of like 0.15 at the uh, at the smaller end granted what I don't know exactly what number this is it can't be zero because no constant no language has zero constants right uh, but then it stabilizes out although granted there is not a lot of data coming at the end hmm, interesting 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 all right so um the ratio of gaps to inventory size is higher um, for smaller inventories. As inventories get larger, the um, ratio stabilizes to about 0 0.8. This happens at around 30 segments. Cool. Okay, so, uh, and I don't know where this, I'm going to place the stress on this, but Dantvadan um, is saying that very large inventories will have a series of, of constants that differ in one feature, such as phonation, additional secondary articulation. The conclusion isn't that unintuitive. Yeah, I see where you're coming from with that. It also kind of comes down to the fact that this paper considers gaps only from a very particular perspective. It's only within stops, fricatives, and affricates. It's only with respect to voice voiceless pairs. And it's, um, yeah, so that that's, that's a limitation uh, that was imposed to make the study doable. But it's important to keep that in mind. You know, many languages distinguish more types of phonation, um, more voice onset times, um, you know, we have aspiration. Uh, we have, you know, other kinds, other kinds of constants altogether. So, yeah. What do we have to say about areas? Do, 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 do. The five most common within manner stop gaps for all macro areas. So this is looking at aerial effects. Are given in table twelve. Okay, where's table 12? Oh, it's, hmm. does this viewer let me rotate? No. All right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna ignore that for now. We are going to ignore that for now. Let's go on to see, what does this have to say about sound change? Okay, this is kind of interesting. Where do gaps come from? Gaps arise due to sound changes. The loss of P in Proto-Celtic is a classic case, right? We have, um, Latin pater, Irish aher. So this was there at one point, but uh, as is reflected in the Latin cognate, but not anymore. So we lost the P in Celtic. Um, it's also been argued that process of sound change can be shaped by structural asymmetries, therefore, thereby performing a gap filling function. So that's an interesting idea that that languages sort of abhor a vacuum and if there's one of these gaps then sound change will quickly fill it or maybe not quickly but will tend to fill it um that seems interesting that's an interesting thought uh, i don't know if that's true and neither does the author of this paper because we do we would need to have a, a data a database of reconstructions and we don't have it but Testing if there are connections between present day gaps and sound changes is more straightforward as one only needs access to a sample of sound change processes. Okay, interesting. Hey, this might be interesting, chat. Unidaya, I'm assuming, project. A combined data set of 13,000 sound change processes has been compiled by me based on the data from these sources augmented with additional data on Sino Tibetan languages. The sound changes in these data set are of three types. Deletion of single segments, epenthesis of single segments, and single, single segment to single segment change. It's a very skewed data set because mostly they are from African and Eurasian languages. But given this data set, we can see if a particular segment is more likely to be a source of a sound change or a reflex, that is a, the output of a sound change interesting i don't know 
I don't, I, I don't know enough about this data set that the author is using to be able to say what's going on here, but I'm kind of just mostly interested in the data set itself. Can we actually, uh, looks like the, the link is broken. I really wanted to read that. Where did it go? Wait, where did it go? Where did it go? Hello? Am I going nuts? Okay, I don't want, Chad, I don't want you to see this, this display, this is embarrassing. Okay, yeah, never mind. That didn't happen. Maybe we can manually, this is the riveting content that I know you tune in for, is me manually trying to go to, go to links, copy link. Ah, they messed up the URL. Well, I think we may be out of luck. This was probably once a noble database. This is kind of like, like what, what I'm thinking here is this is basically the, the index diachronica, but done into a, a format that can be queried. Um, and, and that's kind of interesting. I don't know exactly what we want to say about it uh, because we can't get into it, but what does the author say? The author says that constants corresponding to major within man or stop gaps are indeed more likely to undergo a change than to be a reflex of a change. Interesting. So the idea is that the author has collected all these sound changes that are, that, you know, a sound can be a, a source segment. It can be the, the, the thing that the sound was or the thing that the sound becomes in any given sound change. And it seems that the consonants corresponding to the major within manner gaps st in stops. So within manner, we remember, is um, fixed, fixing the manner, varying the place and, and voice onset time. So something like um, if we have p, b, k, but no g, right? That would be a within manner, a within manner stop gap. So it seems that these are more likely in this database to be on the left side of the arrow for a sound change, g to whatever, versus on the right side of the arrow. So we have more evident, well, we have more instances recorded of sound changes where g becomes something than where something becomes g. Now, I don't know if we want, we can do like, I don't know, what is this really telling us? Is this telling us something about the kind of languages that we've documented, given that those tend to be mostly Eurasian languages? Um, I don't know. It's interesting. It's, it, it, it's definitely provocative. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So what is the conclusion that the paper draws from this? The discrepancy seems to indicate that gaps and stops and fricatives arise in two different ways. Fricative gaps are the product of inventory growth. Inventory is acquiring some fricatives and not others. Whereas stop gaps are more likely to occur, arise due to the loss of segments. So that's an interesting hypothesis. Let's write that down because that's kind of cool. So the hypothesis is fricative gaps, uh, fricative gaps uh, occur um, because languages acquire fricatives, but not everywhere. Stop gaps occur because languages lose stops, but not everywhere. Well, that's interesting. And I wonder how we could test that. But for conlangers, if you are watching this and you're a conlanger, you may want to uh, use this as inspiration in your own work. Uh, Echo asks, "Is has this been saved on any Internet Archive sites? I doubt that, that would work because it looks like it's a dynamically generated sort of database accessing program. So I will have to look into that. Doesn't look, uh, doesn't look super promising. That's a shame. That's a shame. Okay. And then, yeah, then we talk about inventory gaps and segment borrowing. So then the, the idea is if we have an inventory gap, is it going to be filled by borrowing from other languages? 
if a language lacks a typologically frequent consonant and borrows words from other languages, chances are high that those words will contain the mi uh, missing segment. Therefore, it's hard to establish real bias in this regard. Yeah, interesting. I don't know. I don't know if we can say a lot about that. Okay, so interesting. Interesting. This has been an interesting experiment. Um, I'm going to just do a few conclusions here. So I'm going to come back. So what have we learned about the nature of reading linguistics papers? Well, it's, it's something that requires quite a lot of concentration and it probably should be done with a certain amount of climate control. But other than that, we've learned that linguistics papers have a sort of characteristic organization that we should approach them with a particular, uh, with a pr particular topic in mind, um, rather than just trying to take everything we can get from it. Now, in this case, our topic was pretty broad, so we ended up taking quite a lot from the paper. But notice that we didn't worry so much about the history of the question, who else has done the research. If we wanted to delve more into this question, that's something that we would probably want to do. Uh, and if we were writing a paper ourselves on it, we would definitely have to do that. We learned a few things about, uh, about gaps. We learned a, of a good way of formalizing them so we can actually run these sorts of, um, or not run, but we can do these sorts of studies. Uh, we have, um, we've learned what some particularly common gaps are in different, in stops, fricatives, and affricates. And we have a really intriguing hypothesis about the source of gaps in constant systems, which is that fricative gaps occur because languages um, acquire fricatives, but not at every place of articulation at the same time. And stop gaps occur because a language loses stops, but not in every place of articulation at the same time, which is kind of interesting. So I think, I think we'll, we'll stop here. YouTube, you have been uh, a joy to, um, in the future, present this to, I guess, if that makes sense. Uh, come back next time. Uh, if you like this, this whole uh, style of, of segment, by all means, uh, let us know in the description and, you know, all that good jazz, like and subscribe and the things I'm supposed to say, but always forget to. Um, and uh, we will see you next time.